So good evening, everybody. Good evening. My name is Walter Ihejirika. I'm a Catholic priest from Nigeria. I'm also a professor of development communication and media studies in the University of Port Harcourt. And I would like to begin on a note of appreciation to the management of the center, to Bill, and especially also to my brother Stan for getting me involved and acquainted with the Center for this Center for Catholic Theology and Intercultural Theology. And it has really been a very wonderful experience getting to know about the Center and being involved in some of the activities I've organized in the last five years. Uh, it has really enriched me personally and has opened a lot of avenues for research for me. And I'm also appreciative of the fact that the center tries to be interdisciplinary in all the activities they engage. Some of us who are not fully theologians, but are more in the other areas of study, like I'm in communication studies, we are really enriched when we interact with others in theology, in ethics, in anthropology, and other fields. I think it's a very, very wonderful thing that the center is doing by encouraging and helping in interdisciplinary studies of this South, I believe that it's the way to go, and it will be quite helpful to the church to improve her academic efforts and to find solutions to the problems of the world. And here we are today to continue our search, interrogating on the issue of war and how to help the church to build peace. We have already listened to a good number of scholars and we have seen different perspectives. And I know we have already been enriched, but it's not yet over. The center has prepared a lot for us. And this evening, we are going to listen again to a very important scholar who has both the academic and also the practical knowledge in the team of our conference. It is my pleasure to introduce to you, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Robert Meher. He's a professor of humanities at the Hampshire College. And he has really been involved in studies, especially about war and the effects of war. But before he got into all this, he has been also a great scholar he studied at Notre Dame and came out summa cum laude. And also, he studied at the University of Chicago. Later on, he joined the faculty of Hampshire College in 1972. So it's been quite a while there. And over the years, he has gained a lot of academic and practical knowledge. But prior to that, he taught religious studies and theology at Indiana University and the University of Notre Dame also. He has held visiting professorship in numerous colleges and institutes and universities, including Trinity College, Dublin, and also Yale University. So you can see with me that our presenter, our key speaker this evening, is quite knowledgeable and quite loaded, and has also a lot of publications in this regard. His recent works include Rethinking Heroism in an Age of Endless War, Killing from the Inside Out, Moral Injury and Just War, and War and Moral Injury, a reader, a recent book he co-edited with LTC Douglas Pryor, who is a retired U.S. Army of the United States Army. Professor Maher has also offered workshops on the tr translation of contemporary production of Asian drama. So he's also involved in drama. He's also involved in the translation of those dramas. And he has also been inf involved in the production of those dramas in colleges and universities, both in the United States and abroad. He has directed productions at such venues as Samuel Beckett Center, Dublin, and another center for performing arts in Kolkata, India. 
So in the recent times also, he has been engaged and participated in a number of events and programs concerned with the healing of the moral injury of veterans, their families, and their communities. And so ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me and an honor to welcome and ask Professor Robert Meyer to speak to us this evening on the theme, Just War, a Convenient Untruth. Professor Meyer. It's a great privilege to be here, and I'm very humbled by all the presentations and by all the work and that you do and your and your lives. It's, it, it's challenging. It's also challenging to come at the end of a long day, and so many uh, at the end of, of of so many wise and and um, <coughs> learned and compassionate words. I I sat for a half hour or so before before this, trying, wondering what in the world I could say that hasn't been said. And it reminded me of my uncle Patrick Sarsfield Marker, um, who was one of ten uh, from, of an Irish immigrant family here in Chicago on the north side. Um, my uncle Pat was the second youngest of, of the ten. His parents in the late part of the 19th century and the first two decades of the 20th century brought these ten children into the world and then um, and then passed out of this world and left the ten children to fend for themselves which they did and which was only possible probably in those days when they decided they all dropped out of school my uncle Patrick whom I just mentioned dropped out in fifth grade and they all went out and got jobs and raised one another supported one another mm -hmm. and but my my uncle um, Sars, he was known as Patrick Sarsfield Sars, um, he hated chicken. Uh, and that's going to be relevant in a moment. And he never wanted to eat chicken, so whenever he would be visiting with us, with my wife and me out in Massachusetts, he, um, we, we would offer, we asked if he liked chicken, he said not at all, you know, he really was anything but chicken. So he finally got to the bottom of that story, and it was that all through his childhood, uh, the family could only afford a single chicken. And the custom in the family was to start with the oldest in the feeding, uh, and they would select what part of the chicken they would get. And Sarge always got the neck. <laughs> so that's what he thought a chicken tasted like. <laughs> I feel a little bit like I've been given the neck. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> now, there have been two mentions of Romero moments, as a phrase that has been used here. Uh, I'll tell you of my Romero moment, my conversion to nonviolence and to peace. It came when I was six years old um, in Rogers Park. Rogers Park, which at the time was flooded with two kinds of veterans. Veterans of World War II, US military veterans, um, many of whom were immigrants, first generation. Um, and the other was were, were Holocaust survivors. Rogers Park in the 1940s, late 40s, early 50s, had more Holocaust survivors than any city in the world other than Jerusalem. So I was surrounded by war and its effects. Everyone I knew, practically, I mean, all the adults I knew, had, had served in the military, and they were, they were damaged. Um, and I loved every one of them. And so, but I loved one particular man who was probably at that time at most in his mid-twenties, maybe younger. And my friend who, or my closest friend, who lived above me in the apartment building on Ashland Avenue, um, his dad had served with Patton. He was a very short man, fortunately for us, because his uniforms, <laughs> with a little bit of work on the part of my friend's mother, would fit us. And so he, she trimmed down all of his uniforms, or 
once he was willing to give up. And we, he would train us in close order drill and in the profession of arms, as it were. Uh, and we used to play war um, with, you know, with cap guns, plastic guns. Um, and, um, but the man I, I, I became very close to, the, this person in his, in this veteran in his probably mid-twenties, um, lived in, in just down the street from us, and he had a patch of grass in front of us. Rogers Park, as you know, is not a park, or as those of you from Chicago, <laughs> is not a park. And there, was, um, there, there wasn't much green around me. We played mostly in the street. But there was this one patch of green, and that was sometimes our, uh, we would gravitate to that, to, to there. And this man didn't seem to have a job. And whenever he saw us out there, whenever he saw he had my friends and, I mean, out there playing, not necessarily playing war, but he, he, he would come out and he'd give us piggyback rides on his, on, his, on, you know, on his shoulders. And he was just so kind, so loving, so, uh, so full of play with us. He seemed to love to be with us. Every other adult I knew had jobs, but he was available all the time to play with us. And one day, um, however, he, we were having a battle, a mock uh, battle in his front yard, and he came out and he was, he was changed, he was serious. Um, he said he wanted all of us to sit in a circle right there. He had something to say to us. And, um, and he, he said, you're playing at war. War is not a game. He said, I've been to war, you need to know what it's like. You need to know what war is. And he began to tell us what he had been engaged in. He was, he was an army ranger, he was a commander, a commando. He was probably, I think he was 17 when he went to war. Um, and he was uh, engaged for a year and a half, um, killing children, essentially, because in the last year or so of the last year, year and a half of the war, um, uh, German, the German youth were being dragged into, into, into the war. And, uh, and he would, at night, because he, he was a, a you know, commando, he would go out, darken his face, bring, usually only, he would only use a, uh, a knife, and he would go out and, and, and get intelligence go behind enemy lines, and he would, he would be forced at times um, to, to kill one after the other of guards and so on. These young children, really. He told us how they died in his arms. He would sneak up behind them, put his hand over, over their mouth. He would turn their heads, and they would be staring into his eyes mm -hmm. in terror as, as he, you know, as he plunged his, his sword in, I mean, not his sword, but his dagger or his knife, his K-bar knife into, um, you know, into the back of the, um, you know, of this boy. And as he began to tell, to, to, as he began to, to tell us these stories, uh, one episode after the other, he, he progressively <coughs> began to tremble. He began to sob. He, his eyes, he was, he, he was overcome. And his wife, his young wife, who was pregnant at that point, very pregnant, she came out and got down in the grass next to him, put her arms around him, cradled him, and then, and then brought him in. But before he went in, he said, I want every one of you to promise that you will never go to war. Never, ever. Um, so that was the day I became a pacifist. And uh, so I owe veterans, uh, I owe him, um, because he taught me, he taught me about war. I also owe the fact that, owe the book that I wrote, Killing from the Inside Out, to a veteran, um, a veteran who became a close friend of mine, a Marine career officer who served at Fallujah, and at, and came back, um, resigned his commission, um, in in protest and. He's written a marvelous book and, 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 and entitled 
Packing Inferno, the unmaking of a Marine. But I was over at his house one day, and he said, you have to do something for me. He said, um, war is never going to end. He said, we will never be at <coughs> war until we're rid of just war theory. So he said, you have to drive a stake, a wooden stake in the heart of just war theory. And I asked, why me? He said, because you're committed on the one hand. On the other hand, you're, you're a, a patristic a scholar. And you studied Augustine. I did. I wrote my dissertation on Augustine. Um, so you're prepared to do it. Basically, you know the enemy. You know his weakness. <laughs> and, and, and write write it out of write this doctrine out of existence. I don't think I've done that. But I did my best to um, to challenge challenge us for theory. But I never would have written that if it hadn't been for him. Um, I've learned so much from veterans, and. I learned one other lesson from veterans, and that was um, from my brother, who came back um, while I was, while he was in Vietnam, I was trying to decide whether to go to prison or to Canada, and he, um, um, and when he came back, I, um, when he came back, um, he was so damaged. Um, it took him 35 years to recover. Um, but I could not hate veterans when I met my brother. And I, um, so I realized that hating war had nothing to do with demonizing or hating veterans. Um, it, it, it could involve demonizing the, um, what, it, what is done by them in war. Certainly not, not those, those men and women. So, um, so, so whatever I have to say here, you know, is the product. Because I work, I work with veterans um, for the most part. What I've learned, I've learned principally from them. And scholarship has just clarified and given me words. Um, but, but the essential truths and the untruth of the just war theory, I, I very much owe that conviction to many of them. Just war, a convenient untruth. We shall know nothing until we know whether we have the right to kill our fellow men or the right to let them be killed. Albert Camus, 1956. Wars begin not with the first shots fired, but with the first lies told. Generic lies like, there have always been wars. War is part of human nature. Wars have winners. Wars can be just good, even holy. Then there are the lies tailored to the moment. We didn't ask for this. We can't just walk away. Better dead than red. Swift and surgical, over before we know it. We are the good guys here. God is on our side. Let me give some examples. Lies and promises drenched in blood. Launching the 20th century's first global conflict, the Great War to End All Wars, Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm famously boasted in 1914 that German, Germany would rapidly defeat France in a matter of weeks, and then Russia in several months, thus promising total victory in time to bring his, home tr bring his troops home to celebrate Christmas with their loved ones. Six months later, swift victor victory and Ferlicka Weinhoff, um, Weinachten set aside. Sigmund Freud added his own, even more lethal words to the Kaisers. These are his words. When the fierce struggle of this war will have reached a decision, every victorious warrior will joyfully and without delay return home to his wife and children, undisturbed by thoughts of the enemy he has killed, either at close quarters or with weapons at a distance. We might well ask what entitled Freud, neither prophet nor psychic, to offer such a blind and, <coughs> and blinding assurance. Surely it was not his ignorance of war and of war's invisible wounds. Instead, as he explained, it was his professional confidence in the sophistication of civilized men 
who had shed what he called their ethical delicacy of feeling. Unlike their superstitious, these are his words, benighted forerunners, savage men who feared the vengeful spirits of the men they murdered, modern warriors know better than to allow their military service to haunt them. It remains hopeful, however, for the future of humanity that he was so profoundly mistaken. It was not only scientists and national leaders, however, who paved the war to paved the road to World War I with lies. Poet and military cross recipient Siegfried Sassoon, or Mad Jack as he was known to his men in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, reminds us otherwise in his poem entitled They. The bishop tells us, when the boys come back, they will not be the same, for they have fought in a just cause. They, laid, they led the last attack on Antichrist. Their comrades' blood has bought new right to breed an honorable race. They have challenged death and dared him face to face. We're none of us the same, the boys reply, for George lost both his legs and Bill's stone blind. Poor Jim's shot through the lungs and like to die. And Bert's gone syphilitic. You'll not find a chap who served that hasn't found some changes. And the bishop said, the ways of God are strange. <coughs> strange indeed. Stranger still, however, was the bishop's blasphemous presumption that his or any war is God's doing, God's special cause. Surely it would be more honest to describe Europe's march to war in 1914 as a descent into madness. In the words of former Ambassador Joseph Musumeli, when he writes, without any sense of regret, remorse, or equivocation, Europe grabbed itself by the throat and committed the greatest act of collective suicide in modern history. Not since the Peloponnesian Wars had a civilization so thoughtlessly and recklessly demanded its own destruction. We must be very careful not to undo them. <coughs> we who have lived through the over 30 deadliest wars waged in the, in, since the 11th of November 1918 can draw upon our own, draw up our own lists, and some of those lists have been drawn up here, our own lists of the lies told to ignite and sustain those conflagrations. But in doing so, we should not <coughs> overlook the mother of all war lies. <laughs> that nuclear arms have made the world safe, that they are instruments of peace. Never mind that the human race and our beloved planet, our beloved planet Earth, have any number of times been a hair's breadth from nuclear annihilation, and that we remain at this moment and always precariously balanced on that brink. Living, walking, working, loving, raising <coughs> our children, atop a catastrophe waiting to happen. We are assured only by our threats of assured mutual destruction, in other words, by the unthinkable. And yet, we think it every day. What is wrong to do, however, is wrong to threaten. Our threats darken us. Granted, writes Michael Walzer, granted, killing millions of innocent people is worse than threatening to kill them. It is also true that no one wants to kill them, and it may well be true that no one expects to do so. Nevertheless, he writes, we intend the killings under certain circumstances. That is the stated policy of our government, and thousands of men trained in the techniques of mass destruction and drilled in instant obedience stand ready to, and they stand ready to carry it out. And from the perspective of morality, the readiness is all. What we condemn in our own government, as in the police, is the commitment to murder. Albert Camus shared similar reflections on the lethality of thinking murderous thoughts in an historic address he gave at New York University in the spring of 1946, his first and only public address in the United States, a talk that he entitled The Human Crisis. And these are his words. 
At the end of this long night, we finally know what we must do in the face of this crisis-torn world. What must we do? Call things by their name and understand that we kill millions of people each time we agree to think certain thoughts. You don't think badly because you think... <coughs> you don't think badly because you think you can be a murderer without ever having, been, ever having killed, and this is why we are all more or less murderers. To the question, what we, must we do, he <clears throat> gives this answer. The first thing to do is simply to reject in thought and action any acquiescent or fatalistic <coughs> way of thinking. Rather than rethink the policies of the Cold War, however, we in the United States and our long-term opponent have resolved to double down and invest trillions of dollars in the decades ahead to updating and expanding our nuclear arsenals. No policies in human history, writes Daniel Ellsberg, no policies in human history have more deserved to be recognized as immoral or insane. Why this madness is the first question that comes to my mind. Why this madness? We are told that it is all about our national security, the world's security, yet from the school duck and cover drills of my childhood in the 1940s to Donald Trump's delusory ongoing courtship of Rocket Man, I don't believe a word of it, not when I follow the money. The Cold War and the arms race are and have always been root and branch an economic juggernaut, and the same is true of our hot wars. This realization came to Brigadier General Smedley Butler after a distinguished three-decade combat career in the Marine Corps, receiving two medals of honor and a chest full of other medals. When General Butler retired from the Corps, he was the most decorated Marine in its history. He later summed up his service in these words, I spent 33 years in the Marines, most of my time being a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer for capitalism. Of war, in which his years had been steeped, he had this to say. War is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, and surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. Wars, of course, are not fought by businessmen, bankers, or brokers. Wars are fought by those who suffer war's losses rather than by those who amass its profits. It is ironic and angering that the most lethal and effective public lie told to enable empires, kingdoms, and nations to marshal armies and send them off to kill, destroy, and die is a lie invented by the Church of the Nonviolent Christ more specifically by bishops Augustine of Hippo and Ambrose of Milan in the fourth century. I have little doubt that it was a lie first fabricated in good faith, a white lie as we say, but one that, like a cancer, eagerly metastasized and spread, becoming more deadly with the passage of time. The lie I have in mind is what we know as just war theory. While its original aim may have been to limit as well as to allow the use of deadly force, it has been far more successful in unleashing violence than in controlling it. Like a wiki te text, just war theory and its precepts have been freely expanded and updated across 16 centuries to address and accommodate the open-ended evolution of warfare and the deepening of humanity's <coughs> addiction to it. When we consider the Crusades, the conquest of the Americas, the religious persecutions of wars and wars of Europe, the Great War, the Good War, the Cold War, the Forever War, the invention of gunpowder, the invention of nuclear fission, we may well wonder whether there is any war or weapon, any street strategy or tactic, any exercise of force that just war theory won't eventually authorize or at least condone. 
provided we have the right intention. I say this because in Christian ethics from the first century onwards, and Mike focused on this, brought, brought this out very well, um, from the first century, Christian ethics focused, the, the, focused on the intention behind our actions rather than on the consequences resulting from our actions. Augustine summed this up in his notorious counsel to love and do what you will, dilige et quo vis, fa, vis fa, and thus maintained a sharp line between heart and hand, between inner disposition and outward act. The eminent philosopher and theologian Peter Abelard, seven centuries later, supported this view and expanded it, arguing that God, in his words, God pays attention not so much to the deeds that are done as to the mind with which they are done. Add to this the doctrine of double effect, and the gloves are simply off. The late Oxford philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe made precisely this point, remarking honestly and harshly that this is a marvelous way of making any action lawful. She then went on to explain, this same doctrine of double effect, this same doctrine is used to prevent any doubts about the obliteration, obliteration bombing of a city. The devout Catholic bomber secures by a direction of intention that any shedding of innocent blood that occurs is accidental. I know a Catholic boy, she writes, who was puzzled at being told by his schoolmaster that it was an accident that the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were there to be killed. In fact, however, absurd it seems, such thoughts are common, she writes, among priests who know that they are forbidden by the divine law to justify the direct killing of the innocent. It is nonsense to pretend that you don't intend to do what is the means you take to your chosen end. Just war theory has indeed, over 15 centuries, been increasingly weaponized to provide moral cover for the policies and practicing of warring nations, while hoping to soothe the often tormented consciousness, consciences of warriors. It still performs the same function quite effectively as demonstrated by President Obama's explicit appeal to just war theory to defend his controversial policy of targeted assassinations. As for the soothing of warfighters' consciousness, Army Infantry Captain Michael Hoffman has this to say. Let's be honest, most of the theory, referring to just war theory, let's be honest, most of the theory is there to make civilians feel better about sending, sending, sending someone else's sons and daughters to war. So where did just war theory come from and why? A crucial question, a crucial question, inviting a complex historical theological response, while admitting of a much simpler one. I have developed the long version elsewhere and offer only the short version here. As I see it, the unexpected and radical redefinition of the Christian church in the fourth century was driven by the decriminalization and eventual privileging of the church by the Emperor Constantine. Prior to the Edict of Milan in 313, the church was seen by Roman authorities as at worst subversive or at best marginal, a threat or a freeloader, in any event not a committed imperial stakeholder. And that was just as well from the and that was just as well from the Christian's perspective, <coughs> for its kingdom was not of this world. That is, until Constantine embraced the church and offer her the keys, or at least a set of the keys, to the kingdom. Virtually overnight, the church that had eschewed military service in the Roman legions, as well as <coughs> any imperial office involving the exercise of violence, now, revolved, now resolved to step up to its new responsibilities to defend Rome's borders, as well as to maintain security and the rule of law within the empire. To pray for the emperor and the legions, as the ardent pacifist Tertullian had done, was one thing. But to partner with the emperor and march in the legions was quite another. To do this in good conscience 
required the recalibration of that conscience. And it was Augustine and his mentor Ambrose who took on that theological task. Essentially, this meant arguing that there were two kinds of killing, one that offends God and alienates the killer from God, and the other which does neither. With this simple distinction, Christian just war theory was born. War, after all, is about killing. And so, with, it, with at least the theoretical possibility of sinless killing, came the possibility of other forms of sinless physical violence, including torture. Augustine gave a clear and explicit defense of, of his, the use of torture, which Augustine, and he defended it, liberties which not only Christian nations, but also the church freely exercised in the centuries to come. Today, most people are more comfortable speaking of moral theory of moral injury than of sin. Let me start that over, because I, uh, I would obviously write about moral injury. Today, most people are more comfortable speaking about moral injury, in other words, killing without moral injury than killing without sin, although they come down to the same thing. In contemporary terms, Augustine's contribution was to was to proffer war without moral injury, killing without moral injury. Throughout history, the goal of military strategists and the tentative promise of kings and politicians to their troops has been killing without dying, killing the enemy while incurring minimal loss of life. This is the aim, obviously, of any military. <laughs> Meanwhile, holding just war theory close, the church in its care of souls has shown the way to killing others without sin, without moral or lethal sin, without soul death, soul death. In all this and in all these centuries of just war, it is truly remarkable that the term just war theory has survived in our churches, our military academies, and our centers of power. What refreshing honesty, just war theory because just war has never been anything other than a theory, a failed theory, a theory daily disproven in war zones and execution chambers, a theory widely disavowed by veterans who know what they are talking about, and by the silent, heartbreaking testimony of military and veteran suicides, roughly one every hour, a tragedy that the Pentagon and the Veterans Administration now recognize to be rooted principally in moral injury. Put simply, writes Captain Michael Hoffman, put simply, the theory of moral injury is a direct challenge to just war theory. Under just war theory, if I follow the rules, this is Michael Hoffman again, follow the rules, Michael was supposed to be here. He wrote a couple days ago and, and uh, he said because of church and family obligations, he just he couldn't. Uh, couldn't come, but he, he hoped this would be very, a very fruitful gathering, as, as it certainly has been. Um, under just war theory, he writes, if I follow the rules, if I follow the field manuals, then I have done it right, and my soul is safe. But doing it right often doesn't make things right. It doesn't even come close. In contrast to just war theory, which gives us ways to become comfortable with war, explains Hoffman. Moral injury reminds us that every death wounds. The last one kills. It is surely an understatement that in the words of former Marine Captain Tyler Boudreau, Tyler was the Marine who convinced me to write against just war theory. It is surely an understatement in the words of former Captain Tyler Boudreaux, you cannot achieve excellence in war and humanity at the same time. And it is not possible he says, to reduce one's regard, it is not possible to reduce one's regard for an enemy's life without reducing one's regard for all life. We simply can't have it both ways, as Augustine proposed and hoped. 
I would propose instead that there is simply no such thing as just war. Just war is an oxymoron. Just causes, yes, but not just wars. Legal wars, yes, because nations write, law, write laws that suit them and further their purposes. Arguments in defense of war without moral injury are as false and fabricated as denials that smoking causes cancer and emphysema. Killing wounds and too often kills the killer. It is years of listening to veterans, not years of reading books, that have convinced me of this. But in saying this, I, I'm, I have my reading glasses on, not my distant glasses. I got, I got that. Okay. okay. In saying this, I'm not done here. So far, I have concerned myself with untelling a lie, the promise of war without moral injury, the license to kill without a clear, with a clear conscience. What remains is far more difficult to acknowledge, and that is to acknowledge the resonant humanity of combatants and to consider the guilt of the bystander, the immorality of doing nothing. Here again, I am indebted to the combat veteran I have combat veterans I have come to know, respect, and care for, who are unquestionably men and women of extraordinary character and commitment. While nearly all of these, whom I know well, have come to question quite radically the waging of war, they have retained a core commitment to service. In the military, they learn to subordinate their own well-being, even their lives, to the safety and survival of their unit, their corps, and their country. They learn to dread letting down their fellow soldiers more than losing their own lives. In forming and living this life and death bond, they found a love that many or most of us may never experience apart from our immediate families. I'm going to skip over some. Um, no one, writes John in his gospel, no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Military training and service instills not only the willingness to take life, but also the readiness without hesitation to give one's life for others. I am reminded here of what Army Major Sean Levine, an Orthodox priest and a military chaplain, once wrote to me describing his ministry. I always approach veterans, he says, as those who have broken themselves upon the anvil of this nation's defense, often for causes way beneath the dignity of their sacrifice, the, the sacrifice they're willing to make. Even as we condemn war, should we not feel compelled to honor the sacrificial love that so many soldiers embody? It is this commitment to protect and defend others at the expense of their own lives that so many of the veterans I know are most loath to abandon, even though they have renounced war. I have in mind here the same Marine, Tyler, who told me that he had become a borderline pacifist. He was almost there. To describe the remaining border between him and the total renunciation of lethal force, he pointed across the street to several children playing in a neighbor, neighbor's front yard. Among these children was his own, his own son. He said, he then went on to say that if someone suddenly attacked those children, or any children for that matter, he would not stand by and let them be killed that he could not live with, he couldn't live with that. Instead, he would do whatever was needed to stop the attacker, even if it meant injuring or killing them. Listening to his words, I was and remain conflicted, as even the nonviolent church has been and remains conflicted on the whole and confused. We can hear this confusion in the two 2004 response of Pope Francis to a journalist's question regarding the church's position on U.S. military in intervention to halt the murderous advance of ISIS. In these cases, he said, where there is an unjust aggression, I can only say that it is licit to stop the, the, the unjust aggressor. I emphasize the word stop, he said. I'm not saying drop bombs, make war, but stop the aggressor the means used to stop him would have to be evaluated. Like Pope Francis here, every recent pope from John XXIII on, while condemning war, has also affirmed the necessity and right to perfect, protect and defend the helpless. Pope John Paul II, in his homily to those gathered for mass in Drogheda in Ireland in 1979, 
asserted without equivocation that violence is evil, a lie, and a defeat for humanity. I agree with these words, as with so many veterans I know and, and everyone here, um, including those who still could not live with themselves were they not to protect the helpless when it was in their power to do so, even if it meant sacrificing their own lives and putting their souls in peril. This is precisely the dilemma faced and the decision made, for example, by Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Ernesto Cardinal, two men who have been described as militant pacifists. Militant pacifists, an oxymoron to be sure, a, contradict a contradiction in terms, yes, but life is riddled with contradictions, not all of which we are able to resolve in the moment, or perhaps ever. We know well how deeply Dietrich Bonhoeffer struggled with his decision to join the plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler and his inner circle. That his cause was just and his plot necessary gave him little or no consolation. He knew what he was doing. He was planning a murder. He believed that in doing so he was committing a grave sin and that he would take that sin to his death and to his God and Savior, on whose mercy he would throw himself. In his ethics, Bonhoeffer reached for light in dark times, struggling to discern and accept his responsibility as a Christian confronting impenetrable and transigent evil. He understood that the Christ to whom he prayed, in his words, was a breaker of the law, and that following him would demand the same of him. The origin and goal of my conscience, wrote Bonhoeffer in his ethics, is not a law but it is the living God and the living man as he confronts me in Jesus Christ. For the sake of God and of men, Jesus became a breaker of the law. He came to be forsaken by God in his last hour as the one who loved without sin. He became guilty. He wished to share in the fellowship of human guilt. Bonhoeffer came to understand that innocence, blamelessness, is not the highest or truest Christian calling. On the contrary, to follow Christ, to imitate Christ in a broken, sinful world is to take on the sins of the world and to die for them without any excuse. He wrote this, When a man takes guilt upon himself in responsibility, in responsibility, and no responsible man can avoid this, he imposes his guilt, uh, he imputes his guilt to himself and to no one else. He accepts responsibility for it. Before other men, the man of free responsibility is justified by necessity. Before himself, however, he is acquitted and he's acquitted by his conscience. But before God, he hopes only for mercy. What Dietrich Bonhoeffer came to understand and accept was that to be sinless in a sinful world might just be irresponsible. Washing the world, the world from, his, from our hands may produce clean hands, but is it what God calls us and called him to do? This was the question that Bonhoeffer wrestled with and in the end decided in the negative, convinced that he was being called by God to repeat the sin of Cain and murder his brother, his fellow man, created as he was in the image of God. Thomas Merton, too, until his untimely death, struggled with, struggled with total pacifism and the life he had embraced in a monastic as a monastic renunciate, concerned he as he wrote, not to be a guilty bystander. Both Merton and Bonhoeffer rejected just war. This was not a difficult call for them, but the total renunciation of violence was, it was more troubling. When we turn for guidance to the Gospels, to the life and words of the nonviolent Jesus, we see that he went to his death without resistance, without threat. That was his choice, not to defend his life, but to offer it freely a choice that Christian martyrs have always embraced. Interestingly, for Augustine and Ambrose, and the architects of just war theory, the one exercise of violence that was never, never sinless, never morally justified was self-defense. That was the one form of violence that, that was always evil. Um, I think I'm going to have to skip over Ernesto Cardinal and his quarrel with Daniel Berrigan. Um, maybe I won't. Uh, all of it. I'll, I'll, I'll. 
Ernesto Cardinal, um, if, you, if you're not familiar with that name, um, he was one of Thomas Merton's Trappist novices um, at Gethsemane um, and was an equally committed pacifist. But when he was confronted with the massacre of innocent children in Nicaragua, he came to accept resistance as a necessary evil. And he made a challenging case for his position in this controversial interpretation of the famous counsel of Jesus to resist evil, but rather to turn the other cheek. That scriptural passage has come up a lot. He writes this about that. He says, this doesn't mean not to fight. It means not to fight for yourself, but for others. And Christ says to turn the, turn the other cheek. But it's your other cheek, not the other cheek of other people. Christians who don't fight for the revolution are turning either, uh, aren't turning either one of their cheeks. They're turning the cheeks of undernourished children or the hopelessly ill. They're turning the cheeks of abandoned widows, of workers robbed of their work. Another Catholic pacifist and mutual friend of Merton however, objected to the militant words and actions of Ernesto Cardinal and the liberation theology he espoused. In an open letter to Cardinal, Daniel Berrigan wrote these uncompromising, these uncompromising words. Thou shalt not kill. Love one another as I have loved you. If your enemy strikes you on the right cheek, turn him to the other. We are really stuck. Christians are stuck with this Christ the impossible, unteachable, irreformable loser. That's a serious debate, um, with, which I think we have to delve into more deeply, not here, <laughs> um, not now. In agreeing with, the, with both of these statements, I am indeed honestly stuck, and I fall silent. In this I suspect I am not entirely alone. Unable to conjure a satisfying conclusion to the issues I've raised, I will close instead with a familiar parable and a question. First, the parable. Here I have in mind the lesson of the Good Samaritan. A man was going down from Jerusalem, Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going by down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of it, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever whatever more you spend. And Jesus' conclusion, go and do likewise. None of us can miss a lesson here. Passing by a neighbor or anyone in need and doing nothing is unacceptable. Now the question that haunts me. What if the Good Samaritan had arrived on the scene earlier when the neighbor was being stripped, beaten, and robbed? Can we simply stand by and do nothing? Do we wait and minister to the victim once the robbers have left and the neighbor lies half dead? Or do we do something else? Whose other cheek do we turn? What does mercy mean now? Clearly these are violent men, unlikely to be stopped without violence. What instructive sequel to the parable of the Good Samaritan can we, should we, write or even imagine? I have raised this question not so as to undermine or soften my own and others' condemnation to war and commitment to peace. Precisely the opposite. By acknowledging the humane compulsion to protect and defend the vulnerable in extreme moments of immediate peril, a compulsion that has driven so many soldiers to risk and even sacrifice their lives, we may just remove a barrier to their joining the ranks of peacemakers. Why, you, you may ask, is this important? One reason was raised by, by Mauro that peace, making peace requires the contributions from everyone. That includes these men and women. 
So why is this important? After all, those in military service and veterans represent less than 1% of the U.S. population. True. But servicemen and women, and especially combat veterans, like victims of war and refugees, speak with a fusion of passion and pain rarely found in others. They know war firsthand. They hate war and carry its wounds day and night. The nation listens to them. And if we in the peace movement listen to them, we will discover uniquely credible and committed allies, brothers and sisters, willing, even aching, to put away the swords they have wielded and beat them into plowshares. Plow Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, we have burst <coughs> into Professor Robert Meyer. Uh, he has shared his experiences with us and also has given us a lot to reflect on. But the discussion continues, and as he pointed out, the responsibility is for all of us. And so we can begin to participate in this responsible activity by bringing forth questions or comments based on his presentation. So. I would like to switch those, so we, okay, we have the first person in as, as I sit here and listen to the various presenters, presenters I'm thinking that it's uh, acronistic to talk about just war, when what we're really talking about is just annihilation, just on the side, uh, a number of other things like that. I, the, the change that we had in our theory of war came on, it has come on rather late as far as teaching. It wasn't in the Baltimore Catechism that I can, and I, I think I knew that document quite well, that as far as uh, the, the theory of Senator C Cicero never made mention, or his theory. But I, the, I think what we came out, how we came to this was, we inherited Deutschland new Morales and uh, it was a, there was a different theory that we had when we were the, we thought we were the sole possessors of nuclear uh, technology for the bomb. Uh, that was, that, that conceit was betrayed by people that were also knowledgeable about it. And we, it didn't make a difference, but we went to the, the theory of we would be the dominators of the world, and and we would have the bomb, and that was that was where we were uh, right in line with Deutschland New Morales. But then, when when others got the bomb, then we we stuck with that. We would be we would overpower, and uh, our enormous nuclear arsenal is, is only evidence of that. Of how many how many times we had the possibility of annihilating the human race. But that was all still kept into that theory of, uh, uh, the, the just war theory was, was tagged on to that situation, but it's an entirely different theory, that, or, or prospect that we're ending up with, not just that it's the last resort or something like that. But uh, the, uh, the, this, this theology, I think, of the just war theory well, I once had to take Joe Faye's place up at, uh, when he had a Fox Christie conference on it, and he didn't want to have to face the, the Quakers about it, so he asked me to take it on, and and uh, I just admitted it. it the uh, uh, just war theory was just a holdover from trying to to keep ourselves accommodated in, in the Bali politic, but. Uh, the, the, the thing of a just war theory, I don't think, is it has any relevance. What we're talking about is, is on the side. Well, it has relevance in the sense that it's taught in every military academy in this country. It's, every soldier has to be learned in it. It's taught in nearly every military academy in the world, at least in the, in, in, in the developed world. It's, it's the central doctrine of warfare. Um, 
which makes and my friend uh, Jonathan Shea, who is the one who coined the term moral injury, um, who actually once held the uh, Jonathan Shea is a, is is you know I'm he's like an so bad, I'm sorry. I'll and he sit down. yeah okay. thank, thank you for that yeah. but he he said you know that that um, just war theory is is as American as apple pie. I mean, we have fully inhaled it. And, um, and he said, if it were ever removed, I mean, if it were ever discredited, the military would have no moral um, grounds to stand on. In other words, it would be, it would be a shockwave through the, uh, through the system. That's why the effort, I think, to discredit just war theory for the for the Pope Francis to renounce it um, uh, on behalf of the Catholic Church and so many senior military officers are Catholic. Um, it would be it, it would be a profound blow to to uh, you know to our war efforts, our commitment, our addiction to war. Um, I think when you. Your invocation of Deutschland über I got it turned up. Yeah, <laughs> but, I mean, the, the, where that is in fact quite relevant is that General Marshall, after World War II, said that if we ever adopted a professional military, uh, we would be no different from him and the Third Reich. That we could never afford to have a standing, a standing army, a professional military. That that would destroy. The United States and would turn us into a totalitarian, totalitarian state. Um, so that it I, sounds I extreme to invoke the, to say to say that in some way that's become our bad, but it has become rather in in some ways our our, our curse. Um, All right. So we got a Mario got a question. Okay. Another question. Uh, okay. Yeah. An interesting uh, to say thank you for what you said in the way. <clears throat> And the way you said it. My comment is that uh, I'm from a generation that never knew war because I'm quite young and I thought about my grandfather who was sent first by Mussolini in Spain to fight the civil war along with Francisco Franco and when he came back he was sent to to Albania to fight against the poor Albanians who had not done nothing against Italy and as a consequence he came back to Italy and completely lost his faith and it took him 40 years to come back in the church. And one thing struck me from your tale, that I never, I, I was very close to my grandpa. I could never get from him a word about wartime. He always refused to talk about war. He became black, <coughs> never had a tale. And unfortunately, I had, oh, because of my job, I get to new war in, uh, in Central Africa and South Sudan. And I sort of know now why didn't tell me anything about that. And um, about what the veterans told you, um, if uh, someone come to kill these children among, uh, my children is among them, I should stand before him. I should stand against him to stop him. And uh, I think that this question strikes me as well. And uh, I think about my daughter. Uh, so, uh, the only answer I, that comes into my mind is that instead of St. Paul, I mean, I'm running the good run, I'm trying to keep my faith, and the example of Jesus is so high that it will take my entire life to get a little bit closer to what he said, to example he said. Yes. And so it's, we have no answer, but we try to keep up. Mm -hmm. That's Thank my you comment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, you, your, your view, your work is extremely challenging to me. And inspiring that I, I know that's the solution, and it's in those instances, not at the situations Mike was often evoking, where we essentially go to war to stop war. Um, that's that's a fool's mission. We we all know that it's in those circumstances. My wife teaches first grade in the public school. I remember in Connecticut and at school that was closely affiliated with her is Sandy Hook. They were laid out in the same way. If the if the if the shooter, the young young boy, had come in to her school uh, instead of Sandy Hook, come in the door and gone to the right, two rooms down to the first class.
first grade class, my wife teaches first grade, it would have been her um, standing in front of those children. We have to look at the situation. Do we, in fact, um, say no one should go in, in with the use of, of any force, um, try to stop that killer until he's killed every child in the school? You know, we, uh, I know that we can say that's a, that's a fabrication, it's an extreme case, but it happens 30, 40 times a year in this country. Um, and I know that the solution is, is, is gun control. I mean, the elimination of all weapons. Amen. Absolutely. David. But we're not there. Um, and what do we do? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. So we've got another question, please. Hi, um, it's great to meet you. Thank you for your writing. Um, really appreciate it. So I just want to share a brief story. Um, do you know the Antoinette Tough story in Georgia when the guy broke into the school? I think it was a middle school about four years ago after Sandy Hook. And all the kids ran outside. He had a bunch of guns on him. This woman named Antoinette Tough um, was in kind of the main office. Cops are all outside, you know, ready to break in and shoot them up. <coughs> and she's on the, the 911 call talking to them. And the guy with the guns is, is talking to somebody else. And she doesn't know who it right. And she she centers herself. She was a Christian. And she starts, she recognizes, she says to herself that this is a, a human being, not a monster. And she listens to what he's saying on the phone. And she realizes that somebody on that other line cares about him. Somebody loves him. And when he gets off the phone, she says, that person really, really loves you. And he um, starts to tell her that he, he forgot to take his medication that day, mm -hmm. right? And he shouldn't have done that. Um, and she starts to share about how you know, everybody goes through things. Like, I went through a divorce. I have to take care of the same son. It's really hard for me. And he, um, she goes back on the 911 call, and she says to the police, like, this guy needs to go to the hospital. He doesn't need to go to prison. And I will walk outside with him to make sure you don't kill him. And in that kind of solidarity, that willingness to accompany him and risk her own life. Um, he, he says he wants to get on the, the, the loudspeaker and tell the kids that he's sorry. And he starts to put down some of the guns. He still has some other guns. And she reveals to him like her um, struggle with suicide. Because she was recognizing that he was going into a dark place. And the story kind of ends where, you know, she uh, she eventually says it's all right for the cops to come in, and they come in and they shout, intimidate, but nobody is killed. And so, I think those are kind of the moments and uh, the stories that can uh, really spread our imagination about what's possible in these pretty extreme things, and that we don't need to frame it as Am I a bystander or am I a person who uses lethal force? Yes. I think that sets us up for a kind of a narrow, <coughs> limited development of our imagination. Right? So I think it doesn't. So I think these stories can help us see that if human dignity is not consistent with killing, and we are Christians who are to illuminate human dignity in all these moments. Um, that we can choose dignity over the, the risk that's uh, of survival in a particular moment. And we don't quite know how it's going to turn out, but we know we're eliminating human dignity. And that's, that's working and that's happening. Those moments certainly expand our, our imaginations and our hearts. And the, the the teachers at Sandy Hook, you know, put themselves in front of their children. Um, 
I, uh, there's an, another woman from San Diego, mother who lost her, her, her first grader. And her son, uh, when his friends were being shot, his classmates were being shot, her son put himself in front of, because he was reloading his gun, um, he put himself between the shooter and, and his own friend and kept saying, get out of the room, get out of the room, get out of the room. He got them all out of his classroom and, and just blocked the view and was shot and killed. Um, you know, who is going to do anything but, but, but weep and praise those moments? Uh, I'm just trying to honor um, honor the, the doubts and the confusion of Don Hopper and others who um, I, I think it's complicated and, and, and uh, no one the story you tell is, is one, one story and there are others teachers who, who you know, who stood in front of the children who were shot, and then the children were shot. Do we, do we want to not renounce unarmed police? I mean, personally, the the situation. I mean, I, I, I when I was teaching in Notre Dame in the theology department years ago, this was 1967. I think I wrote an essay for the New York Times on kind of pacifism and explaining myself, and I said, you know, since none of us know how we would expect, if our children were being attacked, how we would respond. Passivist, not someone who would, who might not respond with violence. A pacifist is someone who disarms himself. So, when in the moment of passion and and, and terror uh, arrives, he's in no position to to be lethal. Um, I mean, that's the decision I would say for an individual. Is is a pacifist is is someone who does his best to never to, to be in no position to be able to kill a fellow person. Because I could never answer for myself, as I think Mike was saying as well, how I would respond in that situation. If I had a gun, I might use it, but I'd make very sure to make sure I don't have one. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, all right, so who's next? Uh, all right, let's go. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, uh, really to Purdue Father about the, if you like, the Trinitarian foundation of discourses of this kind. You know, from the point of view of uh, the Christian um, understanding of God. Now, I I do have a challenge. You know, for some personal. I think that just happened within the last 24 hours, um, which I can share here that I have one of my good friend of mine was uh, shot dead uh, last night in Nigeria. And I'm following the, the thread of uh, WhatsApp response, God will punish and destroy those who did this. And a lot of the God, um, God question. So began to come back to my mind. I just finished reading a book by Gregory Boyd on the crucifixion of the warrior God. That I uh, think, at a personal level, I've not kind of worked this out theologically. That a lot of our conversation about just war and violence, uh, I think, should begin with uh, who we claim God is that offers justification or even reward for wars. You know, that if you died in war, you have chaplains. I just had one of my students ask me to write a recommendation for him to join the Canadian uh, uh, military chaplaincy. And I said, you can get the recommendation from another professor, but I don't think I will, that you should be doing that. And he was quite disappointed. But then, isn't this the work of God? He says, we are doing this for God. We are, you know, that's part of the priestly work to make, uh, bring people closer to God and to help them to, you know, respond to their vocation so that uh, they can live a uh, fulfilled life here and then get rewarded, hopefully, in the next life. 
So what do you think about the idea of a God who is still in many people's consciousness uh, is a God that can revenge, a God that can reward you for defending the faith, especially in many places today, like when you have cases of murder, you know, cases of persecution against Christians in my homeland and in many places, priests being killed, uh, Christians being killed, and there are some uh, bishops who are saying it's time for us to take up arms. Thank you for that easy question. <laughs> I'm very sorry for, for the pain you feel. What do I think of God? I mean, I, I don't... I think I know that, that, that Jesus was nonviolent, uh, that his message was unqualifiedly nonviolent, and that we're called to, to follow that. Um, I think it's a complicated path, is all. Uh, is, uh, and, and as far as chaplains, I, I think I would have given, I mean, every time one of my students talks about joining the military, um, I have my work cut out for me. You know, I, I, I do everything I can to convince them not to, not to do that. Uh, with a chaplain, it's another matter. Um, many chaplains, are, are war chaplains. By that I mean they, they, they bless the troops, they bless the war, they're like my, you know, uh, my eighth grade Saint Jerome in um, priest chaplain of our elementary school football team who would, you know, who would lead us in prayer, the same prayer that the team on the other side was, was saying as we would, before the game started, and uh, I always wondered about that, even we're praying to the same God. Um, the, the, I remember, maybe I shouldn't, I don't want anyone to, I don't want to invade my own brother's privacy, but um, when, when uh, I think, for instance, Cardinal Spellman in this country was the epitome of, 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 of a warrior priest in the sense that he was, um, <coughs> He went to Vietnam when my brother was in Vietnam, and he preached to the troops. My brother was there, uh, and uh, my brother was a chaplain's assistant. Uh, and he said that um, Cardinal Spellman preached that this was a holy war, that they were Christ's warriors, that this was um, this was a this was a holy war, and they were doing the work of God. My my brother said he was the only person in that he ever wanted to kill. Um, uh, my brother refused to fire his weapon in Vietnam uh, and was defended by his chap chaplain. He served as a chaplain's assistant. But that was the one moment he practically gave in, you know, in the sense that because that, um, I mean, he never would have, but that, nevertheless, that, um, that was evil. And, and, and Cardinal Spellman, it seems to me, was in that respect of of most them um, for what he was doing was was most them. His intentions might have been pure and perfect. Um, the, the chaplains I know are do anything but advocate war. Their work is pastoral. They realize what what evil is being done, uh, and they try to serve. I mean, the the Seventh Day Adventists um, who are pacifists. I know the the direct. The head of all the Seventh Day Adventist cha um, chaplains in the U.S. military, and uh, thought, you know, this is very strange how Seventh Day Adventists are chaplains. Um, what is it like? And so we, they have served ever since the Civil War, and they their mission in as chaplains is 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 the care of souls and to decry and curse and, and condemn war publicly among the troops. I mean, this is, um, so I think there's a prophetic role to be played by chaplains, and I'm amazed at the extent to which the military permits that within their ranks. Um, that's a long story, because I've talked with a lot of chaplains about it. 
one of my closest friends, you know, a, an Orthodox priest who's a chaplain with, with the U.S. Army Infantry, First Cavalry, has been deployed many times. He refuses to bless the troops. He refuses to bless, he, unless he, bless, he blesses the, en the enemy of the people, he blesses this conflict zone, but he won't, he won't pray for victory, he won't condone any use of violence on um, the troops, and he says what you're involved in is, is a profound evil, uh, and, and when he, and his, he said without exception, his men, after they go out on any mission, and he, and, and, and he's with them, and they, they say, you know, you're the only one who acknowledges the death of, of people that were, who were engaged in. Now, I'm aware of all the contradictions and pains there, but he's uncompromising, and he's never gotten any pushback, either from the, the, the military uh, at any level. So I think we may have time for at least one or two more questions. So, okay. So, if I understand, in defense of chaplaincy in the military, um, some of the older people are probably familiar with the story of the USS Indianapolis and how it was struck by a Japanese torpedo as it was coming back uh, and they were lost. The movie, The Night of the Sharks, really was what described what happened to those people out there. Um, I did some research last year on it, and one of the last chaplains to die in the Second World War was on the USS Indianapolis. And when the, with the initial explosion, he made it off the ship, and he spent two days just swimming back and forth to dying men, giving them comfort, telling them they were going to be with God, until his own body wore out and he died in the water. So, one of my nephews, too, is a chaplain in the Navy. He wanted to be a minister, but he said, I think that there's a calling here because these men need comfort. And um, they're faced with many challenges. And, and so he, he really enjoys the job. Uh, it's not a job for everybody, Stan, but that, you know, I, I can only, there were many stories of terrorism over the years of chaplains who just provided so much comfort to people who were wounded or dying or who sacrificed themselves to save others. So, Not all chaplains are cheerleaders. That's mm -hmm. the... the uh... <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, all right. Uh, next question, please. Uh, maybe the last. Yeah. <laughs> so, 62 hours ago, we were watching the clock. We have anniversary of Warsaw Ghetto of, of Rising in 1943. My question is easy, and it's not easy. What you chose? You go to Gastamber in Treblinka or fighting? I, I, I have no right to answer that question. The question, this, this gentleman pointed out that it's the anniversary, 70, 70th, is what? Yes. Um, yes. Yes. The Warsaw, yes. Warsaw yes. Ghetto. Okay. And, and uh, he said, faced with, the, yeah. faced with the decision whether to get onto the train and go right. to the, the yeah. Treblinka death camps or to fight, what do I? the great right decision would be that and, and I simply said I, I have no right to answer that question. I have no right to answer any of these questions. Um, I tried to be clear about what I feel strongly about and what I'm confused or conflicted about. All right, so we have time still for the last, very last one. <laughs> My name is Anna Gaffrey, I'm from Croatia, from Europe. Uh, I want to say uh, I live in a society where 30 years we live after the war, like in the war. When we speak about just war, I like that we include this problem, that after just war, we don't have just society. And when we don't have just society, is the question, is it God's will? 
just war. We have just war, and every war is just. We don't ask us of the criteria of Augustine and Thomas Kinski. We we have everything is my one person that I personally love uh, say when you uh, fight in name of nation and faith or religion, it is not seen. You cannot be in, in wrong. And that is problem of just war for me, because we don't live in peace. All right, I think uh, we have really shared from the knowledge and the wealth of experience of Professor Robert Emmett, and uh, we have also shared our own personal experiences, the more to come. But as we know, the conversation continues. But on, our time is up, and every good thing that has a beginning also has an end. And so I'm compelled to call to an end this session. And once again, we say a very good thank you. Thank you so very much for your